the challenge with the church of Jesus Christ in present day is we have shifted from raising responsible Christians to raising Christians that are obsessed with consumption. So the average believer in Christian circles or around church nowadays has a burden just for consumption. There's no intentional, deliberate effort to raise people who understand that the basis or the base requirement for a Christian is that you must be able to take responsibility. So most of the time, if you see the programs that we do in church, if you see the activities that run around the Christian space, it has to do majorly with uh, the intention to meet a specific need in the life of the Christian. So our early morning prayers revolve around things like prayers for visa, prayer for breakthrough, prayer for open door, prayer for this and prayer for that and prayer for one need or the other. So we can spend two, three hours online praying that God will open doors for us to get visas because the church thinks in present day that the emphasis of the Christian should be on what products God has on display to meet their unending needs. So the average Christian is a consumer. He doesn't know the burden of responsibility she doesn't know what it means when the Bible speaks about bearing the Lord's yoke. The consequence of that is there are many things that exist in the heart of God. There are many burdens that exist in the heart of God. There are plans, there are intentions, there are agendas, there are purposes that exist in the heart of God. But they don't have a platform to find expression in the earth. Because for those things to find expression in the earth, there are functionaries that must be available in the earth realm to see those things come to pass. Those functionaries are we, those we call spiritual midwives. So things that exist in the heart of God that God wants to birth in the realm of men can only find expression if such functionaries exist. But such functionaries will not exist if the church is not deliberate about showing the average believer the pathway of spiritual responsibility. Just like Pastor Mina was saying just now, you, you think that when they go for witchcraft meetings, their burden is that they want to build a house. You think that when Ogbanjis gather, their burden is that they want to go and buy makeup. Or they want to sew bubu. Or they want to wear Gucci. In the heat of the crusade last night, by the time the hand of God came down and demonic spirits were being identified, a demon began to speak. Say, I'm older than this institution. I've been in the four corners of this institution. She said, I am a lesbian spirit. You think that that spirit came to Unam the Azikiwe University to wear shoe. Or came to that university to get a degree, to get first class. By the time we probed further with that spirit as I was praying for her, she continued to give us details of how she entered into the lady. That a virgin young man was sacrificed to give her access to the young lady. Joshua, Ovie. Where's Ovie? Yes, they can tell you. But you want to come to church and the average Christian's burden is a car. Marine spirits will only consider a car a breakthrough if it will help the kingdom of Satan to advance. So some things you call a breakthrough has no relevance because kingdom does not gain profit. 
So there are things that are, that are trapped in the belly of the spirit and our generations are suffering an obvious lack because functionaries that can partner with God to guarantee life in a generation are lacking. We are raising Christians who are heavily dependent on their pastors. They can't survive on their own. Take them out of church space and put them in Iraq for one week. They will become Muslims. Without doubt, they can't survive persecution. They can't defend their faith. We are not raising Christians that can die for their convictions. That the only way to stop them believing is to kill them. We can't raise, they are not raising those kind of Christians. Because just don't be angry with me. I know it's easy to get angry with me. Don't be angry with me. You just do a census. Look around church. Our programs, what is the emphasis? Is it training? Is it discipleship? Our, our, our demon, denominations like camps where you go to and come out as a military officer. But we go to church because we are hoping that God will advertise another product, pure water, to quench your thirst. Consumers. The consequence is that the cloud of God will be heavy upon a territory, heavy upon a family, heavy upon an institution, heavy upon a generation, but rain won't fall. Because until there is a man to till the ground, God will withhold rain. Rain won't fall. And see, I did some careful studies and I found out that one of the popular metaphors in scripture, I don't know why, but you see, I have trained myself that if I see things being repeated in scripture, I need to pay very close attention. One of the consistent metaphors that God uses in scripture is the metaphor for betting. And there are plenty, but let me just show you some. Media, give me John 16, give me 21. John 16 and verse 21. You will see. And if you take your time to study, you will come to the same conclusion. Plenty metaphors. Plenty times, sorry, that the metaphor for betting is used. And every time it is used, check what I am saying. Every time it is used, it's used to describe a very, very urgent, important, and sometimes difficult matter. That God is trying to communicate. In John 16, we don't have the time because I want to bring us back to pray. The prayers that Pastor Mine led are my prayer points. But it means that we are going to come back to pray. It. Heal the man. The problem is never on God's side. Never. The problem is always God seeking for a man to stand with him. It's always a matter always a matter. So what, you, what is happening in your family is not strange. There are families that have gone through it before. The reason they survived, that family had a midwife. Things that are happening in your personal life are not strange. The reason the other person came out unscattered, came out with a testimony is that the person knew how to don the toga of a midwife. Because you can be a midwife to yourself. There's what is called unassisted delivery. One of my daughters that is here now, probably I've not seen her, but I think she's around. It was in my car. She gave birth to one of her children. One of these days, I'm going to claim my property and bring it back to my house because it belongs to me. It was giving birth to where? In my car. It, the, all the hospital needed to do was to clean up unassisted delivery. You can be a midwife for your own destiny. And then there's the, there's, the, there's, a, there's the portion of when it is required that you also have to come in contact with a spiritual midwife who can discern your seasons and bring you into the fulfillment of prophecy. In John 16, Jesus here was speaking about the fact that he, he had just spoken to his disciples and told them, a little while you shall not see me. And then again, after a little while, you shall see me. 
On the basis of that, he noticed that they became sorrowful. As they were sorrowful, he needed to use a metaphor to bring comfort to them. To explain that parable that he had given to them. He said, a woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been what? Born into the world. So he was saying to them, a little while I will suffer death, I will suffer burial, but again, a little while, what will happen? I will resurrect. While I am suffering death, while I am suffering burial, you will experience sorrow. But when I resurrect, your joy will be restored. Because every appearance of life, every manifestation of life, always triggers genuine joy. So Jesus is saying to them, when I am resurrected, just like when a child is born into the world, a woman forgets her anguish. When a woman is in labor, she can tell you that over her dead body, she not go born again. In fact, as she's, she's groaning in the labor, she's, some women slap their husbands. Say, now you put me for this thing. Now you do me this thing. Now you do me this thing. Not try him again. No. Not near me. If you near me, I go kick you. If you do this. But immediately a human being is born. Give her one year. She's coming back to meet the husband to say, can we try again? Because at the appearance of life, sorrow is forgotten. You see, you are about to enter a season in April. And it's a season of life and joy. Yeah. You're about to enter a season. Life and joy. Let me show you another one. Give me Isaiah, uh, or give me Jeremiah first. Jeremiah 30, verse 5. Jeremiah 30, verse 5. You see another example, a birthing metaphor. 34, verse 5. For thus says the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Verse 6. Ask now, and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. Men don't labor with child. Why men don't carry pregnancies? Natural men. He says, ask now, have you ever seen a man in the hospital and he's laboring because he's pregnant with a child? He now says, so why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor and all faces turned pale why next verse alas for that day is great so that none is like it and what is that day it is the time of what jacob's trouble but he shall be what saved out of it this is another betting metaphor give me isaiah 28 I think verse 16. Isaiah 28 and verse 16. Is it 28? Let me see. 26. 26, 16, 18. 26, 18. We have been with child. We have been in pain. We have, as it were, done what? Brought forth wind. Notice what happened. We have not accomplished any deliverance in the earth, nor have the inhabitants of the world fallen. It's from this scripture I began to understand the role of a midwife. The first role of the midwife or the ministry of the midwife, what it encapsulates is that a spiritual midwife who is like a watchman, who is like an intercessor, is supposed to be able to bring deliverance to people and to territories. Deliverance. 
nor have the inhabitants of the world fallen. From that phrase, fallen, in my own interpretation is, they have not been brought under the government of God. The second thing that the ministry of the spiritual midwife encapsulates is that a spiritual midwife is supposed to be able to bring discipleship to a people and to a territory. So the first thing is deliverance. The second thing is discipleship. The third thing that I added is that the ministry of a spiritual midwife is supposed to be able to bring people and territories to the place of dedication to God. So this deliverance, discipleship, and what? Dedication. That's what the midwife does. Deliverance, discipleship, and dedication.